Hi there, I'm going to continue with my reading from this book, Awareness Through Movement by Moshe Feldenkrais. And if you didn't already see them, I recorded two videos where I was reading the preface to the book and also a commentary. Uh, what I forgot to say is that the preface um, is the first piece of text in part one of the book, Understanding While Doing. And the next section, or the next chapter in part one, is called the self-image. And so there's a number of um, short chapters in part one. And then part two, as I mentioned in one of the previous videos, he starts laying out uh, the awareness through movement lessons. There's 12 actual awareness through movement lessons uh, that are contained in the book that people can do for themselves. Um, as they read through the book. And um, anyway, we'll get to that later, but I'm gonna read from the self image now. And I just wanna show you, you can see I've got a bunch of underlining in here, but I just wanna show you that there's paragraph headings um, quite frequently. There's a lot of subheadings um, as we go through this section. So I'll be pausing to read those subject headings. Um, and anyway, I'm just, Going to be doing that a lot because that's how the text looks and uh, just so you understand why that is and um, the self image this chapter is a bit longer than the preface so i'm going to break this into two or maybe even three videos let's begin the self image the dynamics of personal action each one of us speaks moves thinks and feels in a different way, each according to the image of himself that he has built up over the years. In order to change our mode of action, we must change the image of ourselves that we carry within us. What is involved here, of course, is a change in the dynamics of our reactions and not the mere replacing of one action by another. Such a change involves not only a change in our self-image, but a change in the nature of our motivations and the mobilization of all the parts of the body concerned. These changes produce the noticeable difference in the way each individual carries out similar actions, handwriting and pronunciation, for instance. The four components of action. Our self-image consists of four components that are involved in every action, movement, sensation, feeling, and thought. The contribution of each of the components to any particular action varies, just as the persons carrying out the action vary. But each component will be present to some extent in any action. In order to think, for instance, a person must be awake and know that he is awake and not dreaming. That is, he must sense and discern his physical position relative to the field of gravity. It follows that movement, sensing, and feeling are also involved in thinking. In order to feel angry or happy, a man must be in a certain posture and in some kind of relationship to another being or object. That is, he must also move, sense, and think. In order to sense, see, hear, or touch, a person must be interested, startled, or aware of some happening that involves him. That is, he must move, feel, and think. In order to move, he must use at least one of his senses consciously or unconsciously, which involves feeling and thinking. When one of these elements of action becomes so minute as almost to disappear, existence itself may be endangered. It is difficult to survive for even brief periods without any movement at all. There is no life where a being is deprived of all senses. Without feeling, there is no drive to live. 
It is the feeling of suffocation that forces us to breathe. Without at least some minimum of reflex thought, even a beetle cannot live too long. Changes become fixed as habits. In reality, our self-image is never static. It changes from action to action, but these changes gradually become habits. That is, the actions take on a fixed, unchanging character. Early in life, when the image is being established, the rate of change in the image is high. New forms of action that had only the previous day been beyond the child's capacity are quickly achieved. The infant begins to see, for instance, a few weeks after birth. One day he will begin to stand, walk, and talk. The child's own experiences, together with his biological inheritance, combine slowly to create an individual way of standing, walking, speaking, feeling, listening, and of carrying out all the other actions that give substance to human life. But while from a distance, the life of one person appears to be very similar to that of any other, on close inspection, they are entirely different. We must then use words and concepts in such a way that they will apply more or less equally to everyone. How the self-image is formed. We confine ourselves, therefore, to examining in detail the motor part of the self-image. Instinct, feeling, and thought being linked with movement, their role in the creation of the self-image reveals itself together with that of movement. The stimulation of certain cells in the motor cortex of the brain will activate a particular muscle. It is known today that the correspondence between the cells of the cortex and the muscles that they activate is neither absolute nor exclusive. Nevertheless, we may consider that there is sufficient experimental justification to assume that specific cells do activate specific muscles, at least in basic elementary movements. Individual and social action. The newborn human can perform practically nothing of what he will carry out as an adult in human society, but he can do almost everything the adult can do as an individual. He can breathe, eat, digest, eliminate, and his body can organize all the biological and physiological processes except the sexual act. And this may be considered a social process in the adult, for it takes place between two persons. In the beginning, sexual activity remains confined to the individual sphere. It is now widely accepted that adult sexuality develops from early sexuality, this approach makes it possible to explain inadequacies in this field as a failure in the development of the individual towards full social sexuality. Contact with the external world. The infant's contact with the external world is established mainly through the lips and mouth. Through these, he recognizes his mother. He will use his hands to fumble and assist the work of his mouth and lips, and will know by touch what he already knows through his lips and mouth. From here, he will gradually progress to the discovery of other parts of his body and their relationship to each other, and through them, his first notions of distance and volume. The discovery of time begins with the coordinating of processes of breathing and swallowing both of which are connected with movements of the lips, mouth, jaw, nostrils, and the surrounding area. The self-image on the motor cortex. Were we to mark in color on the surface area of the motor cortex of the brain of a month old infant, the cells that activate muscles subject to his developing will 
we should obtain a form resembling that of his body, but it would represent only the areas of voluntary action, not the anatomical configuration of the parts of his body. We should see, for instance, that the lips and mouth occupy most of the colored area. The anti-gravity muscles, those that open the joints and so erect the body, are not yet subject to voluntary control. The muscles of the hands, too, are only just beginning to respond occasionally to will. We should obtain a functional image in which the human body is indicated by four thin strokes of the pen for the limbs, joined together by another short and thin line for the trunk, with lips and mouth occupying most of the picture. Every new function changes the image. Were we to color the cells activating muscles subject to voluntary control of a child that has already learned to walk and write, we should obtain quite a different functional image. The lips and mouth would again occupy most of the space because the function of speech, which involves the tongue, mouth, and lips, has been added to the previous picture. However, another large patch of color would have become conspicuous, covering the areas of cells that activate the thumbs. The areas of cells activating the right thumb will be noticeably larger than that activating the left one. The thumb takes part in almost every movement made by the hand, in writing particularly. The area representing the thumb will be larger than that representing the other fingers. The muscle image in the motor cortex is unique for every individual. If we continued to draw such outlines every few years, not only would the result be different each time, but it would vary distinctively from one individual to another. In a man who has not learned to write, the patches of color representing the thumbs would remain small because cells that might have been included would remain unused. The area for the third finger would be larger in a person who has learned to play a musical instrument than in one who has not. People who know several languages or who sing would show larger areas covering cells that activate the muscles for contr the control of breathing, tongue, mouth, and so on. Only the muscle image is based on observation. In the course of much experimenting, physiologists have discovered that in basic movements, at least, the cells concerned link up on the motor cortex of the brain into a shape resembling the body, which they refer to as the homunculus. There is thus, there is thus a valid basis for the concept of the self-image, at least insofar as basic movements are concerned. We have no similar experimental evidence with regard to sensation, feeling, or thought. <laughs>